All right, guys, so this is our second lesson here. Um, unit one, linear functions, we're going to continue that. And today we're going to talk about how to graph linear functions today. Um, last time we looked at the graphs and we found their slopes and their y-intercepts and all that, but today we're going to learn how to create the graphs ourselves. Um, I don't think we're going to be doing bullet two here today, so um, we'll go ahead and X that out. I would like to, it's just that um, since we're doing stay-at-home learning right now, um, I doubt very many of you, if any of you guys have a graphing calculator, and that's something I usually provide in class. So not a big deal. Um, we'll skip it for today. But we will do number three, which is to talk about how the slope and y-intercept affect the shape and position of a linear function on a graph. So from yesterday, we talked about the slope-intercept form equation of a line. The number in front of the x was our slope. So m represents the slope, which is our rise and run. The b represents our y-intercept. In other words, where it touches the y-axis. So if you know those two things, you're pretty good to go ahead and get a pretty nice sketch of the graph. Okay, so let's go ahead and begin. So the first thing I'm always going to recommend to do is to start off by plotting your y-intercept. Okay, so in this case, my y-intercept is negative 1. So I'm going to go down 1 on my y-axis, and I'm going to put a dot at negative 1. And that's my starting point. That's what, remember how we said that's our initial value, the starting point. So that's going to be our starting point. Uh, the next thing is, is we're going to use our slope. So we're going to use the rise and run to find the next point. I decided to type it this time so that you guys don't have to look at my nasty handwriting there. All right, so my slope is here, right? Five thirds. And the five represents my rise. And the three represents my run. And I'm going to use my rise and run to find my next point starting from my starting point. So starting from here, I'm going to go up 5 and over 3. I need to put some marks on my graph here. Okay, now starting from this point, this is important. You don't start from the middle, okay? You start from your y-intercept. You're going to go up 5. So, And when, when I say go up 5, that means you go up 5 spaces. So 1, two, three, four, five. So if I start here, I'm going up five spaces, I would go up this high. And then we're going to go over three. One, two, three. Remember, you're counting spaces. And then you go ahead and connect your dots. Okay? So, step three, connect the dots. So you're, you have a three-step process here to graph the function. Um, start by plotting your y-intercept, use your rise and run to find the next dot, and then connect the dot. Okay? All right. Let's go ahead and uh, let you guys try one of those real quick. So why don't you guys pause the video here and see if you can graph this line. Okay, so this is what it should have looked like. Your y-intercept should have been a negative 1. The most common mistake I see students make or one of the most common mistakes I see students make is instead of starting at negative 1 on the y-axis, sometimes they start at negative 1 on the uh, the x-axis. That's wrong. You know, start in the y-axis, right? And then my rise is 1, and my run is 5. So I'm going to go up 1 space and then over 5 spaces. And that puts me at my next dot, and then we connect those dots. Okay? So that is the basic idea of how to graph a linear function. Let's go ahead and take a look at another example. So you'll notice this time that we're looking at um, what's different is the fact that my slope is negative. So we're going to see how that affects things. So as you guys can see, my y-intercept is 2. So I'm going to start at 2 on the y-axis. But since my slope is negative, we have a couple of choices. What you can do is, is you can either put your negative on the top of your fraction, like that, or you could put it on the bottom, but you don't want to do both, okay? 
And just so you guys know, I really prefer to just always put it on the top. So what that means is, is that when we do our slope now, my bottom is positive, so I'm still going to go to the right eight spaces. But since my top is negative, that means I'm actually going to go down three. So my rise is actually a fall in this case because it's a negative. So that's basically what happens whenever you have a negative slope. Okay. So once again, you could choose to put the negative on the bottom. So let's say you did this. If you did that, that would mean you're going to go left and up. What you don't want to do is go both down and left. Because if you go down and left, that's like doing two negatives, which is actually just going to give you a positive slope. So don't do that. So you could either go right and down or left and up. And I'm always just going to put the negative on the top, which means I'm always going to go to the right no matter what. And the question is just whether I'm going to end up going up or down. So if it's negative, I'm going to go down. If it's positive, I'm going to go up. So starting from my starting point then, I'm going to go down 3 and over 8. So I'm going to go down 3 and then over 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, right here. And then I'm going to connect my dots. Okay, so to keep things simple, what was special about this one is that I had a negative slope, so I went down instead of up okay so let you guys try one of those why don't you guys pause the video and try to graph this really quick okay so your graph should have ended up looking something like this we have our y-intercept of five and my slope is negative half so i'm going to imagine this as being a negative one over a positive two so i'm going to go right two and down one to get to my next point all right let's go ahead and take a look at some other points here. Okay, now I'm going to do um, numbers three, four, and five um, a little bit differently. So what makes numbers three, four, and five special is the fact that all of them are missing numbers. So let's go ahead and talk about what to do if you're missing numbers. So before I tell you what to do about missing numbers, is let me ask you guys this. Um, 3 plus what equals 3? What do you think the answer is? Well, hopefully you guys know that the answer is 0. So when you're missing a number that's being added, and you want it just to be the same, you, it, the, the missing thing will be 0. Okay, we call that the additive identity. But what about if I gave you this instead? What if I said three times, not plus, but three times a number equals three? So three times what equals three? Well, if you're missing a number that's being multiplied, then it's not zero, it's one. That's called the multiplicative identity. Okay, the same thing applies for addition. So for instance, three divided by what number will give me 3? Well, the answer, once again, is 1. Um, division and multiplication go together, so the multiplicative identity applies to division as well. So that's kind of the point that I'm trying to make here when you're missing numbers. So let's talk about the missing numbers. So as you guys know, when you're trying to graph an equation of the form y equals mx plus b, you have three numbers. You have a rise, you have a run, and then you have a y-intercept. So we have three numbers that we care about, a rise, a run, and a y-intercept. Now, if your rise your run, or the entire thing, the slope itself, the rise and the run, neither one of them are there. If those are missing, if you have no rise, if you have no run, or if you have no slope at all, then that means they equal one, okay? But if you're missing the B value, so if you have no B value, that means it equals zero, okay? So if 
the numbers here are missing, they're a one. If the B is missing, it's a zero. And the reason why these are ones and this is zero is because um, these numbers, if they're not there, like let's say I had Y equals um, X plus two. Well, what can I put here so that it doesn't actually change the expression? The answer is a one, because a one times X is the same thing as an X, right? But what if I was missing the two? Let's say we had something like this instead. Well, if I'm missing the a number over here, what can I put here so it doesn't actually change the expression? And since it's adding, that would be adding a zero. So that's like the multiplicative and additive identities. So if you're missing a rise, run, or slope, just know it's a one. If you're missing a y-intercept, it's a zero. Okay, so I'm not going to actually graph the following problems. I'm just going to rewrite them. Um, although you could, we could, I could ask you to graph them. I'm not going to. I'm just going to say rewrite them. And what I mean by rewrite them is uh, I want I want us to rewrite them so that we can see all three numbers that we want. We want to see a rise, we want to see a run, and we also want to see a slope. So let's go ahead and take a look at number three here first. So in this case, I see my rise. My rise is two. I see my run. My run is five. What we don't have is we don't have the y-intercept. And when that's missing, it's a zero. So I'm just going to put a plus zero there. And that's it. Now we could graph this if we wanted to. Once again, I'm not going to ask you to, but we could graph this. I would start at zero on the y-axis, then I would go up to and over five. Okay, but we're not going to do that for the sake of time. I just want to make sure that you know how to find the missing numbers so that you actually can graph them. All right, let's do number four. Now in number four, I have two numbers. I've got a four and a, a negative one. Now the four is like my rise. The negative 1 is my y-intercept. What I'm missing is my run. I'm missing a number in the bottom of the fraction. And anytime you're missing a rise or a run, they're a 1. So you could think of that 4 as 4 over 1. So in that case, if I wanted to graph it, I would start at negative 1. Then I would go up 4, right 1. Let's go ahead and take a look at number 5. So for number 5, um, I have no slope at all. But I do have my y-intercept. So when you're missing your slope, that means that your slope is 1. But if I just put a 1 there, I'm still missing a number. That's like my rise. I also need a run, so I'm going to put it over 1. So in this case, when you have no number here at all, the rise and the run are both 1. And so we're going to start at 2 for my y-intercept, and then I'm going to go up 1 over 1. So uh, I'm going to ask you guys to do the same thing on your student practice here. So for these two problems right here, I would like you guys to rewrite them with the missing numbers so that you know how to graph them if you need to. So pause the video here. And I went ahead and I plugged in the uh, missing numbers here. So for number two, we had no run, so I put a one there. <coughs> Excuse me. And for number three, we had a missing y-intercept, so I put a zero there. All right, back to our examples here for six and seven. So this is another special set. We are missing numbers here, um, but we're, we're missing numbers in a different way. Um, so th these are special. In, in this case, we have only one variable. Okay, so like what if we only have a y and it just equals some number? Well, in that case, it's just going to be a horizontal line. I'll explain why when we actually do our example here, but for now it's just a horizontal line. And, and don't forget, that means your slope equals zero. I mean, that's not really too relevant for the day, for today, I don't think, but it um, might be helpful. Um, if you have x equals a number, surprise, surprise, it's a vertical line. And we talked about those last lesson as well. That means your slope is undefined. Okay. So let's go ahead and graph these a little bit. Let's see what we, we can get here. So for number six, y equals two. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find a place on my graph where y equals 2. Well, don't you guys agree that y equals 2 right here? But that's just a dot. That's not a line. So to get a line, you need at least two dots. Can you guys find another place where y equals 2? Well, how about right here? I don't know what the x value is. Maybe we'll say the x value is 2 also, but it doesn't really matter what x is. 
this is still a y value of two because it's at the same height as the other one. And so if I connect those, you get a flat line. And that means you have no rise, which means that the slope is zero. But anyway, so basically all you have to do is, is find the, the number on the axis of the variable that you have and draw a line through it. So let's do number seven. So for number seven, it's x equals two. So in this case, I want to find where does x equal to. Well, that's on the x-axis, then, right? That's here. Now, another place where x equals 2 would be right above it or below it. For those places, x also equals 2. It's still two spaces to the right. So those are vertical lines, and that's a undefined slope. So if you have y equals a number, find that dot on the y-axis and draw a horizontal line. If you have x equals a number, find that number on the x-axis and draw a vertical line. And remember what their slopes are as well. <laughs> so I think I might have given you guys one of those two. Let's take a look. All right, guys, so go ahead and try number four here. Graph that. Pause the video. Okay, so this is what you guys should have gotten. We're going to find where negative three is at on the y-axis, so that's the right here, and then we're going to draw a horizontal line through it. Okay, and so that would be that one. Let's go ahead and take a look at one more example. So for this last example, the question is, what do we do if it's not in slope-intercept form. And the answer is, get the y by itself. So if, if you have an equation like this one, which is in standard form, um, and, and you want to get it in y, and you, you can't, we're not going to go graph it using the methods we've learned today. If it's not in the right form, it has to have this y equals mx plus b form. So what you have to do then is you have to get the y by itself. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, that requires some algebra. I want to get the y by itself. So I need to get rid of this negative 3, and I also need to get rid of this 4x. So what you're going to do is, is you're going to start by getting the 4x out of the way first by subtracting that 4x on both sides. By subtracting it on the left, the 4x will no longer be on the left side. But whatever you do to one side of the equation, you have to do the other. So I had to subtract 4x on this side as well. Now, these are not like terms. I can't actually combine the 9 and the negative 4x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put them next to each other. I have a negative 4x and a positive 9, and I'll just put them next to each other like that. Now, the next thing I'm going to do to get rid of this 3, well, this 3 is multiplying, this negative 3 is multiplying this y. So the way that we're going to get rid of that is by dividing out the negative 3. But whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. So I have to divide everything by 3 there. So we're going to or divide the negative 3 by negative 3. leaves us with 1y. So we don't need to write the 1, though. We can just write it as a y. And then we have negative 4 divided by negative 3. Well, you can reduce that to be 4 over 3. <clears throat> and then 9 divided by negative 3 is negative 3. Now it's in slope-intercept form. I'm not, I'm not actually going to graph this one, though. Um, we could start at negative 3, then you rise 4, run 3. But uh, I'm just going to leave it like this. So the point is get the y by itself. Now, the steps are going to be pretty similar um, for any problem that's in standard form to, to what I just gave you. Um, some differences might be like, well, what if this was, um, here's, here's one difference. But what if I told you that this was a negative 4x instead? Well, in that case, you'd have to add the 4x on both sides, right? Um, so that, that's one difference I could think of. Um, or, or here's another difference I can think of. What if, what if you had a fraction? That really stinks, but unfortunately that can happen. So let's say, Let's say instead of having a minus 3 there, let's say I had a minus a half. Okay, well, you would still move the 4x to the other side. So let's, I'm going to do that really quick. I was not going to film my work. I'm just going to do it mentally. You would have to add 4x on both sides, right? But in this case, what do you do to get rid of a fraction? Well, what you do when you want to get rid of a fraction is you multiply everything by the denominator. So I'm going to multiply this by 2. Why? Because 
when you multiply 2 over 1 times 1 over 2, 2 divided by 2 cancels out, and you'll just be left with that negative now. But whatever you do to one side, you do the other. So I can multiply this side by 2, so 2 times 4, and also 2 times 9. So it would be 8x plus 18. So if you ever have a fraction, the way you get rid of it is you multiply everything by the denominator. And we still don't like this negative here, so what you can do is multiply everything by a negative or divide everything by a negative, which is basically just going to change the signs. So there's another example for you guys. Um, so there, there can be some differences. Um, there's a lot of differences, but <clears throat> um, basically you kind of have to remember your Algebra 1 a little bit in order to know all the different things that could happen in working with this stuff. So I want you guys to do um, numbers 5 and 6 here. Um, number 5 is pretty chill, not too bad. Um, number 6, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a hint. Um, we don't like these parentheses here either. In slope-intercept form, there's no parentheses. The way you're going to get rid of that is by distributing. So I want you guys to do numbers 5 and 6, and uh, the goal is... I don't want you to graph them, although you could. I want you just to change them into slope-intercept form. So go ahead and pause the video here, and I'll put the solutions up. All right, so here's the solutions. I'll let you guys study those a little bit. Um, for number 6, just notice I distributed first. So I got 5x minus 10, and then I divided everything by 2 to get that y by itself. And it doesn't matter if the y equals is on the right side or the left side of the equation. Um, so that's that. All right, last topic for the day before we close out this lesson. What does the slope tell us about the shape of a linear function? Well, as you guys know, a positive slope means it goes up, and a negative slope means it goes down. Um, so the more positive a, function, a slope is, or the bigger the number is, if it's positive, the steeper it gets. So the bigger a slope is, the more it slopes upwards. So like, for instance, if this was a slope of 1, a slope of 4 might look more like this, it's a little bit steeper. Whereas a slope of a half might look a little bit more flat like this, even though it still is going upwards. Right? Now, the smaller a slope is, the more the line slopes downwards. So, if, so since this is a downward slope, right, let's say this is a negative 1. But if you had a negative 4, that means it's even a more negative. It's even smaller, so it would have a steeper slope downwards than that. Um, or if you had a negative half, well, negative half isn't quite as negative as negative 1, so it's still going downwards because it's negative, but the slope isn't quite as extreme. So, and as you guys know, a slope of 0 would be right in the middle. It's flat line, right? So that's what the slope can tell us about the shape of a linear function. It just basically tells you how steep the line is. Positive lines, you guys know, go up as you move to the right. Negative lines, as you know, go negative slopes go down to as you move to the right. Um, and the more positive a number is, the steeper it is. And the more negative a number is, the steeper it is, just in the opposite direction. So that being said, let's go ahead and take a look at example two here. It says, use the graph below to answer the questions that follow. So this graph, here's your y-axis in black, here's your x-axis in black, and then all these blue lines are different linear functions that are graphed. We have Linear function A, linear function B, linear function C, linear function D, and linear function E. And we have some uh, questions that they want us to ask. So number one says, write the lines in order from least, from greatest slope to least slope. So first of all, if I want to put them in order from greatest to least, let's start with the positive slopes. What do these lines up here have positive slopes? As you can see, A has a positive slope. It slopes upwards as we go to the right. How about B? B also has a positive slope. Um, C has a zero slope. D is going downwards as we move to the right, so that's negative. And E is also going downwards as we move to the right, so that's negative. So the only two positive slopes we have are A and B. Now here's my question. Which of these lines looks steeper to you? Well, B looks steeper than A, doesn't it? Imagine like you're on skis and you're at the top here. Which one are you going to jet down faster? Well, the B is steeper. So that means since B is a steeper slope in the positive direction, B would be the greatest slope up there, it's the biggest slope, it's the most positive. A would be the next biggest slope. 
After that, we have a zero slope, which is C. The other two slopes are the negative slopes. So this one here, this line and this line are both have negative slopes because both of those lines go down as we move to the right. Now, which of those lines, though, is steeper? As you can see, D has a steeper slope than E does, which means that D is more negative than E is. So that means D has to be the smallest slope because it's the most negative, and E would come before that. So there is our lines in order from greatest slope to least slope. Now, a different question comes. Write the lines in order from greatest y-intercept to least y-intercept. Well, y-intercept is where it touches the y-axis. So C touches the y-axis right here. A touches the y-axis right here. B touches, or we have another one touching here, that's D. We have another one touching the y-axis here, that's B. And then finally we have E. But when it comes to um, y-intercepts, the higher up, the point is, the greater it is. So in this case, the line that has the biggest y-intercept would be C because C is the one that touches the y-axis at the highest point. So C would be the greatest y-intercept. A would come after that. D would come next because this third y-intercept from the top is on the line D, followed by B, and finally at the end by E. So um, those were our objectives today, was learning how to graph functions and also to determine what, what, how do the slopes and y-intercepts affect the shape of the graph. And that ends our lesson. Um, I have a similar question here for you. Um, you can practice it if you want to, but if you feel like that's all kind of easy for you, you don't need to. But if you do want to practice it, go ahead and pause the video here and I will put the answers up. Here are your solutions to this problem. Uh, B and A are the positive slopes, and B is greater than A because it's steeper. C and E are the negative slopes, and E is the most negative, in other words, the least slope up there because it's steeper than C. And then D, of course, is a zero slope. Uh, as for the y-intercepts, uh, where they touch the y-axis, um, line A is the one that has the highest y-intercept, followed by E, C, B, and D. Okay, and that's that. So now you're going to do your homework for 1.2 and have it all the notes and the homework both ready to turn in by our next class. And we will move on to our third lesson for the week.